welcome. Swagatam. We are very grateful and honored by the presence of all of you. I would like to try to explain something that is somewhat unexplainable. The origin of this particular festival. There's a beautiful verse in Sri Bhagavad Gita where Krishna tells Patram Pushpam Palam To Yam Yome Bhakta Prayachchati. This is in the ninth chapter. That anyone who offers me even a leaf, a little water, a fruit, or a flower with love and devotion, I will accept it. And when the Lord accepts our offering, the Lord reciprocates with his love and grace. So this is the essence of the path of bhakti, to tune in to God's grace, which is actually all-pervading. It is the sweetest but most gentle and powerful thing in all of creation. The personal love that God has for all of us. And how to tune in? By offering our will to love God. And anyone can do it. How much does it cost to pick a leaf? Do you need a college education to offer a little water? It's available for everyone. <clears throat> it is not the thing that counts. Our Guru Srila Prabhupada, he explains that the Supreme Lord is Bhava Grahi Janardana. He only accepts our love. Because that supreme personality, that supreme absolute truth who's the cause of everything, doesn't need anything. But love is something that is beyond relative logic. I'll give an example. When I was a little boy, I was quite mischievous. And I didn't get such good grades because nothing really interested me so much in the schools. I was too busy thinking of the civil rights movement and you know, the counterculture and trying to change the world to study science and mathematics and that stuff. So my parents were not happy with me. Our next door neighbors, they were getting straight A's. <laughs> and they were well behaved. And yet my parents loved me more. So that doesn't make sense. <laughs> because love is not something that always makes sense. It's based on something very deep, very spontaneous. So Krishna, who is the controller of all controllers, he doesn't need anything from anyone, but wants to love. And wants, if we open our hearts to love God, God fills us with un unlimited love. And that is the principle of bhakti. And how to cultivate and express that love. Anyone and everyone could do it. Just by offering even a little flower with the intent to please, with the intent of devotion. In that sense, bhakti is not determined by our material qualifications or disqualifications. It's simply determined by our sincerity. My guru 
Srila Prabhupada, he defines sincerity as to be without ulterior motives, to be without selfishness, to actually serve with the will for the wealth, being, or the pleasure of the object of our love. There's a beautiful story in the Srimad Bhagavat, one of our scriptures, which is considered to be the conclusion of all Vedic knowledge. Krishna, who is God himself who appeared in this world in a way to reciprocate love in a very personal way, he went to a kingdom, which is called Mithila. In his previous incarnation as Lord Ram, Sita, the feminine potency, the Shakti, the Dini Shakti of the Lord, she actually was born near Mithila. And she lived there. And Ram married her in Mithila. If you read Ramayana, it's a very holy place. So Krishna went to Mithila with some sages and rishis, and two people especially came to greet him at the border of the kingdom. One was the king, his name Bahulaswa. And the other was a very simple, poor Brahmin named Shrutadev. They both invited Krishna to their house. They wanted to have a reception. Just like recently I was in Delhi and the president of India had a reception for Michelle Obama and Barack Obama. So receptions are quite standard when an important person comes. So here's the king. He has his entire palace prepared to welcome Krishna. And here's the Shruta Dave who just lived in a little straw hut with his wife. But they both asked Krishna with the same sincerity. So for Krishna, there's not a problem. He just expanded himself into two forms. But the interesting thing is neither of them knew. Each one thought, he's only with me. <laughs> Krishna is so kind. Can you imagine Shrutadev? He's saying, the king is inviting Krishna to his house, and he chose to be with me. And the king was very humble. This, this very pure-hearted person, I'm not pure-hearted, he's so pure-hearted, he invited Krishna, and Krishna came to be with me. So they were both very, very humble and grateful, and when Krishna came into the palace of, of Bahulaswa, there was marching bands, and there was military reception, and he offered him his own jeweled throne, and they, uh, he had cooks cook hundreds and hundreds of the most delicious preparations out of the most luxurious ingredients, and he offered him um, fanning him with, with golden um, handled yak tail fans, and they were offering him um, jewels and necklaces and crowns, and he had the entertainers of the, of the kingdom dancing and singing and performing dramas, and Krishna was enjoying very nicely. And meanwhile, Shrutadev, he brings Krishna's thatched hut. He didn't have a throne. He just gave Krishna a little straw mat, just like what you're sitting on, but small. And the only food he had was some rice he went out to beg after Krishna agreed, because he didn't have any food. And to fan Krishna, he just took his own cloth and was going like this. <laughs> and as far as entertainment, Shrutadeva himself, who was just an old Brahmin, an old guy, he just started dancing for Krishna. <laughs> And he, he wasn't trained as a dancer. He just wanted to make Krishna happy. So it explains, they both served Krishna according to their capacity with sincere devotion. And Krishna explained how he was equally pleased and gave the same supreme spiritual perfection 
both of them. Because Krishna sees the purpose, the intent, the love in which we speak, we think, we interact with each other. And in which we perform our seva or our service. There's a similar story. Hanuman was building bridge across the Indian Ocean. And a little spider was kicking single grains of sand with his legs. Now Hanuman's arms were really strong. And spider's arms aren't so strong. That's why they need eight of them just to walk. <laughs> So with one, he was just little, Hanuman was taking mountains and putting it to float in the ocean. And the little spider was just kicking one grain of sand at a time. And he was standing in front of Hanuman while Hanuman was at the mountain. And Hanuman said very respectfully to the spider, I'll get out of my way, I'm holding a mountain. And Ram said to Hanumanji, he's doing as much service as you are. You're trying to please me according to your capacity, and the spider is trying to serve me according to his capacity. And Hanuman was very happy because <laughs> he's the very personification of bhakti. Bhakti is the intent of our heart, the spirit of our heart. Bhakti is the process of awakening the love within our heart. So today, many of you were helping to pluck flowers. Now I'm going to speak from the philosophical side to the cultural side, with philosophical message behind it. The idea is, as you're plucking the flower, it's an offering of devotion to the Lord. Now in our temple, we don't all recognize everyone who was here. There were billionaires. There were multi-millionaires. There were simple farmers. There were people from the middle class. There were multi-PhDs. There were people who couldn't write their name and everything in the middle. There were people from all various countries, from Ukraine, from Russia, <laughs> from China, from India, males and females, people who have black complexion, white complexion, yellow complexion, brown complexion, people from the backgrounds of agnostics and atheists, from backgrounds of Jews and Christians and Parsis and Jains and Sikhs and Hindus and Muslims. And it's not that anyone was in a superior position to anyone else. Everyone was sitting on the same straw mat and everyone was plucking the same flowers. And whether it was a rose or a marigold or whatever those other flowers are, they're all put in baskets. And when they're being offered to Krishna, all the f it's one offering of everyone. This is the teaching of Lord Chaitanya, unity in diversity. Lord Chaitanya was Krishna himself who came to this world but he came to crash through the sectarian caste system, which made people according to their birth or their material qualifications either superior or inferior. He wanted to teach us that everyone has the opportunity for the same perfection. In this age of Kali, the most powerful and simple way of awakening our love of God is to tune into the grace of God by chanting these beautiful mantras, the names of God. And Lord Chaitanya 
made the supreme teacher for all time of the chanting of the holy names, Takur Haridas, who happened to be born in an untouchable family. And he was completely rejected by orthodoxy because Lord Chaitanya wanted to teach very strongly. Krishna wanted to teach. It's not about our material situation. The ego wants whatever our particular role is, we want to prove ourselves superior to others. The principle of bhakti is to actually feel satisfaction, fulfillment in being the servant of the servant of the servant, to be a well-wisher of others, to be an instrument of God's compassion to others. So as we were plucking the flowers and they're going into the baskets, it's an offering that we have all made together. And just like us, the flowers have different shapes, the petals have different colors and different fragrances and different names, and they're coming from different places, but they're all being offered together with devotion. So it's a, it's a festival of unity and diversity. If we understand <clears throat> the oneness of our spiritual essence, then we could really appreciate, rather than being fearful of or arrogant toward the differences. Diversity is really beautiful if we understand the unity. And you'll see during this festival, when Krishna's and Radha are offered different the more the different colors as they're being offered just makes it that much more exciting and wonderful. And every petal that's offered to Krishna and Sri Radha, our meditation is as we're with one voice chanting these beautiful holy names. You see, this is what kirtan is. Each of us is chanting individually. But for Krishna, all the voices become one voice. Unity and diversity. And similarly, the flowers. It's the flowers of our love. It's the celebration of unity in diversity. And it's a very appropriate festival, especially for the world today. And flowers are so, all of these flowers are organic, environmentally friendly flowers. <laughs> At least I think so. <laughs> There's a lot of them. But Mother Earth is providing so many wonderful gifts. And even the simplest of those gifts have unlimited value. When Krishna was a little boy in Vrindavan, the gopis were simple cowherd ladies, and they would make butter. And Krishna would come to steal their butter. So many stories. And they would tell Krishna's mother that Krishna's coming to steal our butter. And they tell so many stories of what he would do and how he would do it. And they, and they just couldn't stop talking about it. And Yashoda Mai said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep Krishna at home. They said, no, 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 no. We only make our butter with the hope that Krishna will steal it. <laughs> it's the perfection of all our desires when Krishna comes to accept our butter. And the greatest even a greater joy than seeing Krishna stealing butter is describing to you how he's doing it and talking about, we can't stop talking about it. It's so beautiful, it's so sweet, because this butter is the expression of our love. When our heart becomes very soft with humility and devotion, and Krishna, God will steal our hearts. And there's no greater pleasure than that. 
So years ago, I saw in our calendar, we have a particular calendar with the holidays according to our tradition. Many of them have been celebrated for thousands of years. And there's one festival in the month of January called Pushyabi Sheik. Now, in those days, and still today, I'm not so good with Sanskrit, which is the language of the scriptures. And I was thinking, Krishna says, patram pushpam, pushpam means flower. And this is push abhishek. So this abhishek means to bathe Krishna. On Krishna's appearance day, or Radha's appearance day, we have abhishek where we offer, we bathe Krishna with, with so many wonderful bathing ingredients. So I was thinking, Pushyabhi Sheik means you're supposed to bathe Krishna with flowers and Sri Radha with flowers. So let's celebrate. I don't know why nobody else is doing like this, but we should do it. Because <laughs> this is what this calendar says. So we started showering Krishna with flowers and it became such a popular festival. People love to come to see it. Thousands of people were coming for the Pushyabhi Sheik and soon other places were hearing about it and coming it and seeing how beautiful it was. And there's temples all over the world that has Pushyabhi Sheik. And then I found out that according to the calendar, January is the month of Paush. And Pushyabhi Sheik means you're supposed to bathe Krishna with water and stuff in the month of January. But because I didn't understand, I thought it was a flower festival. <laughs> but when, when I discovered what it really meant, it was already such a popular festival. <laughs> and so many people in so many places wanted to celebrate it. We just keep doing it. <laughs> so in this sense, ignorance is bliss. <laughs> But actually, there are so many beautiful stories in the scriptures. When Ram returned to Ayodhya, everyone showered him with flowers. When Krishna came into Dwarka, in Mathura, in Brindavan, everyone would shower him with flowers. So it is tradition. But as far as the festival, it was revealed in a very mystical way. But my prayer to all of you is that this is a meditation. It's a meditation on the beauty of God's love for us and the beauty of our inherent love for God. If you water the root of the tree, that water naturally extends to every part of the tree. When we connect to that love within ourselves, that love for Krishna, it naturally extends as love and compassion for all beings. That is what bhakti is meant to awaken from within us. And as we're seeing Krishna being showered with flowers, with Sri Radha, the meditation is as we're chanting, with grateful, humble, attentive hearts and minds, we're celebrating, celebrating the unity of our combined efforts to enlighten each other and enlighten the world. And to recognize that in every basket, because it's all mixed up, there's some of your petals. And when it's offered to Krishna, it becomes prasad, becomes his mercy. And at the end, all the one ton of flower petals that are offered on the altar will be showered on us. <laughs> Receiving grace. 
Thank you very much.